Welcome to the St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship Podcast. Today, one of our substitute teaching leaders, Jacob Wearson, will be discussing Genesis chapter 28. St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship, or BSF, is currently meeting virtually on Zoom every Monday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Central Time. For more information and to connect with our class, visit bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. That's bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. Now let's prepare our hearts, open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 28, and join Jacob as he shares truths from God's Word. Well, hey everyone, it is an honor for me uh, always to bring the Word of God to you, and we are in Genesis chapter 28 here in our lesson. Uh, My name is Jacob Wearson. I'm a co-substitute teaching leader uh, in our St. Louis uh, Young Adults BSF class, and it is such an uh, just an honor to bring the Word of God to you as always. Uh, so open up your Bibles. We are diving into Genesis 28. And you know what? I am really fascinated. I'm int- intrigued. I'm excited to enter into this character study of Jacob. And I don't know about you, but I have been uncomfortably identifying myself with some of what Jacob has been doing in the last few chapters. Uh, when we read about his deceit and his lying, You know, unfortunately, that's been part of my sin, part of my mistakes uh, from the past. And maybe it's been part of your story, too. Uh, You know, I saw that when um, that rather when rather than waiting on God, uh, oftentimes I try to control my own circumstances to fit my desires and my desired outcome, uh, similar to what Jacob did in the last couple chapters. And, you know, up until this point, the character of Jacob, you know, may cause us frustration. Uh, It may cause us anger or disdain. Um, But if you think about it, Jacob is not really different from us, or at least from me. You know, what happens as we read the Bible and we open up his word is we receive a closer look into human nature. And, you know, much of that experience can be incredibly discouraging, incredibly incredibly disquieting and uncomfortable, right? Because we're seeing the the human heart as it really is at its core. Um, But before human sin brings us down and causes us to be discouraged, God's great grace steps in and he, and saves a day, as it always does. And we're going to see that here in Genesis chapter 28, as we see Jacob's earthly father extending grace to him in a blessing, and we see Jacob encounter the living God in a dream, a marvelous demonstration of God's inexhaustible grace. So if you haven't picked up on it yet, an overarching theme and doctrine for today is going to be grace. And quick definition, um, grace is the free and unmerited love, mercy, and favor of God given to the undeserving. We've got two divisions here in our passage that, uh, today, Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 through 9, that I'm going to title that Moving in Grace. And then the second division, Trusting in Grace, is going to be Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. And I think a big idea that I want us to pick up from today is that though sin always has real consequences, both seen and unseen, God's grace always has the last word. I'm going to say that one more time. Though sin always has real consequences, both seen and unseen, God's grace always has the last word. So as you open up our Bibles, let me begin with a word of prayer, and we'll start reading verses 1 through 9. Heavenly Father, uh, God of inexhaustible grace, Lord, I come before you and I just ask your blessing uh, as we discuss Genesis chapter 28. Uh, Lord, I pray for anyone listening to this or watching this on YouTube, God, that whatever sins that we're struggling with, whatever burden, whatever is on our hearts, God, that we would lay it before the throne of grace. Lord, may we meet you in Genesis 28 as we discover more about your mercy about your grace, about your personal involvement in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you meet us each time we open your word, and we ask you to bless this time that we have together. It's in your son's great name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, so Genesis 28, verses 1 through 9, our first division, moving in grace. And as I open up my Bible, we're going to read verse 1, and then we're going to stop for a second and consider verse 1. So, Chapter 28, verse 1 reads, So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and commanded him. Now, before we continue, I think it's important to note that phrase. So Isaac called for Jacob. 
So why this doesn't sound too important? So why am I stopping to review? Well, let's remember what we witnessed in Genesis chapters 26 and 27 between Isaac and Jacob, which by the way, I think they have a very complicated father-son relationship to say the least. But what do we see? We saw Jacob uh, tricking Isaac, right, into giving him the blessing instead of Esau. And this sets off a chain reaction of confusion, of rivalry, of bitterness, and adding to the mess of a already unstable family situation. Uh, And when we think about what Jacob has done in the last couple of chapters, and you read uh, chapter 28, verse 1, and you read that phrase, so Isaac called for Jacob, you have to ask yourself, what do you think Isaac was going, uh, should tell Jacob. I mean, our own minds can come up with, if we think about, you know, when we've disobeyed our parents, right? And our parents call us and say, I need to talk to you. It's never, it's never a good thing when we've disappointed them or we've let them down or we've failed or, or done something to disobey them. So I often think I'm like, you know, Isaac could have brought Jacob in and say, you know, I'm really disappointed in you. Or I can't believe what you've done to me and your mother with this. Look at the mess that you've caused. Um, but you know, Isaac, uh, um, and by the way, I think he might've had in a way every right to do that because Jacob does lie to Isaac's face. Um, and I kind of wonder if Jacob's anxiety levels shot up when Isaac brings him in. Um, but you know what? We get a pleasant surprise. And I think even Jacob gets a pleasant surprise in these opening verses because we're surprised to read that Isaac has not called him to chastise him or to get angry with him. What does Isaac do? Let's keep on reading here Uh, in the continuation of verse one, uh, all the way up to verse four. So Isaac says this to Jacob, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to uh, Padan Aram to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham. Now, that is very different than a chastisement or a beratement of what Jacob has done to Isaac. Now, we know that Isaac, you know, because of Rebekah's urging and her efforts to protect Jacob from Esau, um, was sending Jacob away to Laban so that he wouldn't marry Canaanite women. And of course, this is, again, Rebecca's plan to help protect Jacob from Esau, who was planning to kill him. But Isaac, you know, he could have stopped there. He could have stopped at just saying to Jacob, you know, we want you to leave and we don't want you to marry Canaanite women, so just get out of here. And he could have stopped with that. But he doesn't. He, he goes a step further and extends a blessing for Jacob. He prays that God would bless Jacob, that he would take possession of the land that God had given to Abraham. He, he prayed that his descendants' numbers would increase. And you never know, right? But perhaps Isaac changes his mind about Jacob. He realizes his mistake in wanting to bless Esau um, because we know that God had revealed and we know his, his will here is for the promise to continue on through Jacob and not through Esau. That was his sovereign will and plan. But whatever it is, I think we should take pause and just consider Isaac for a moment. You know, undoubtedly, Isaac is a man who has been a recipient of God's grace as we've read the pages of Genesis, through the pages of Genesis. We know that he has certainly learned through the personal experiences of his life that God never abandoned his promises, that in his, gra- that in his grace, no matter the mistakes he or Rebecca or even Abraham and Sarah had made, the Lord's assurances remained true. God never left Isaac. And it could be that this encounter, this experience of God's grace throughout his life had influenced him to not just send Jacob away under the urging of Rebecca, but to actually bless Jacob, to take that extra step and invoke the Lord's protection over Jacob's life. So we think about Isaac. Now let's think for a second about Jacob. And this was borrowing from our lesson over the last couple chapters. Um, But, you know, do we relate to Jacob in any way. I can ask this question in the, in, in the introduction. Do you think that you have a better plan for your life than God? You know, are you worried about what people think? So in your life choices and experiences, you don't even stop to consider God, but rather do everything in your power, even if it involves scheming and deceiving to convince people that you should be accepted 
See, the problem is sinful choices, as Jacob had experienced, have the exact opposite of what we desire. That is always true. And when we read Genesis 26 through 27, I was wondering, and maybe you were too, what if any one of those family members, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, or Esau, through that mess that we read through last week, what if they had considered God? Um, you know, if they had considered that God had sovereignly chose Jacob and would fulfill his promises through Jacob's life, you know, then Rebecca and Isaac would have stopped scheming and obeyed the Lord. You know, if they had considered, stopped and considered that God would take care of them, that he was their portion and strength, that he never fails no matter what is happening in life, you know, perhaps the brothers' rivalry would have eased and Jacob and Esau would see that God has them in the palm of his hands, no matter where life would take either of them. So much could have been different. Now, I don't know, of course, that that would have necessarily happened, but it's interesting to think, right? Maybe things could have been different if they would have stopped to consider God and his grace. You know, but I bring this up because we think about how we relate to Jacob and we think about maybe our sins or our failings or the way that we navigate through life. You know, we have to consider God and his grace. And especially as believers, right? If we are blood bought believers in Christ, then the following is 100% true for us. You know, our sins and the penalty of our sins were taken care of at the cross of Christ. You know, in Christ, we have full eternal, eternal salvation, complete forgiveness, and because of his resurrection, a new life to walk in. He's promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And that changes the way we live. And we'll dive into this a little bit more as we study Jacob in the latter half of Genesis 28. Um, but things change when we soak in the grace of God. But when we don't, that also has a different effect and result in our lives. So we see what happens with Isaac, perhaps when he's in ca- thinking about God and considering God and he's changing his mind and attitude about Jacob, he's blessing him despite what Jacob has done. But then we see the other side of the spectrum and we see Esau unraveling basically. And then the last half of this first section in verses six through nine, we encounter Esau who has not stopped to consider God and his marvelous grace. Now, it's understandable, I think, why Esau is angry. You know, maybe it's his frustration, right? It's got to be his frustration at Jacob's scheming and his lying. You know, perhaps it was part of the loneliness and the bitterness that he was experiencing at the way his mother was favoring Jacob over him. That's got to hurt. You know, but instead of stopping to consider God, instead of taking his bitterness and anger and brokenness to the Lord, he does the exact opposite. And we see in verses six through nine, that in defiance, he marries a Canaanite woman in addition to the wives that he already had. And what a mess that is. And he deliberately broke the hearts of his mother and father and deliberately chose to disobey God's will. You know, these nine verses, I think, are a great example of a heart that has experienced God's grace. That's Isaac as he extends his blessing to Jacob and one that refuses to take God into account. And that is Esau, who runs in the exact opposite direction. And all of this, I think, leads to our first principle. And that first principle is that God's powerful grace equips us to walk with him. God's powerful grace equips us to walk with him. See, God's grace pours into every aspect of our daily lives. You know, oftentimes his grace causes us to come face to face with the reality of our life, no matter how uncomfortable that may be. You know, think about Isaac, right? Something happens in his heart from Genesis 27 to Genesis 28. You know, I'm sure he was still dismayed, right, by the way his son lied to him. And as I mentioned before, Isaac simply just could have followed orders from Rebecca and sent Jacob away without extending a blessing, but he doesn't. He extends that blessing of God's protection and reminds Jacob of, his faith, of God's faithfulness. You know, perhaps his heart is realizing that God's sovereignty can be trusted, It was Jacob, not Esau, that the promise was to be fulfilled. And as we've been reading the book of Genesis, I think it's important to ask, in what way has God's grace made you face some potentially uncomfortable things in your life? Yes, it is actually by God's grace that makes us face these things. It's God's grace that we see our lives for what it is. You know, is it the way that you prop up and control your life to make others think better of you? Is it becoming totally fearful of life's circumstances that instead of waiting on God, you act on your own accord? 
Is there a place in your heart where it's been hardened by disappointment and rejection? Oof, all of those questions hit home for me personally. But be rest assured that God powerfully manifests his grace to the undeserving. And when he does, it empowers us to walk in him. He gives us the grace to face life as it really is, to face reality. And he also gives us the grace to change. And we're going to look about look at this a little bit deeper as we move on to the second division of our lecture today. And that's Genesis 28, verses 10 through 22. And this section is simply titled, Trusting in His Grace, Trusting in God's Grace. So let's move in to the last half here of Genesis chapter 8. And in verse 10, we read that Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Aran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. So let's think about Jacob's circumstances here. He is alone, and he's on his way to unfamiliar territory. And he is in the middle of the desert, and he is fleeing from his family for problems and issues, by the way, that he helped perpetuate. He was not innocent in the mess that has been created from Genesis chapters 26 and 27. And in this lonely situation, the only piece of comfort that he has is a rock for a pillow. Oof, how uncomfortable is that? And, you know, it's not like in our modern days, right, where he could just send a text to mom and dad or reach out real quick. No, he's totally alone in the middle of the desert. But you know what? At least it's quiet. You know, at least it's perfectly still where Jacob is. And all he has to accompany him is the vast stars in the sky. By the way, have you noticed that it is often in the stillness and quietness where we encounter God and the power of his word most clearly. Hmm. And it's in this stillness that God encounter that excuse me that Jacob encounters God in a dream. So let's read about that dream starting in verse 12. And he, meaning Jacob, had a dream in which he saw a stairway, some translations have a ladder, but he sees a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord. And the Lord said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. And I will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Great verses. All right. So we know we've already gone over this. Jacob did not deserve this dream. And what a dream, right? To see that stairway, to see the angels and to see the Lord declaring over his life these promises. But Jacob did not deserve this encounter from God. We've gone over this. He spent the last couple of chapters lying to his family. But nevertheless, God's promises remain true. God in his sovereignty, in his grace, had chosen Jacob to further his promise that eventually would bless the entire world. And those promises that God extended to Abraham that we read a few weeks ago are actually extended to Jacob. And what is Jacob's response at this magnificent dream? Jacob worships. Jacob worships God and he makes a vow. So let's jump down to verse 20 and let's read that vow real quick, starting in verse 20 to 22. So then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. You know, I think um, what's interesting this, well, so first, right, we see that despite Jacob's sin, despite his failure, God's promises, God's presence remain true. You know, and I love uh, Jacob's first response, right? Starting in verse 16, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not 
aware of it. You know, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. That is so cool. I love those verses, right? Because he's been touched by an encounter with God. And despite his sin, despite his failure, God's promises remain true for him. And Jacob makes that vow that we just read in verses 20 through 22, and he humbly comes before God. What's interesting about this is that this is the first time we really see an encounter being between Jacob and the Lord. Now, before this, we don't really know a lot about Jacob's relationship to God. Uh, we can definitely assume that he has heard stories about God, that he has heard stories about God's faithfulness to his family, to Abraham, to the generations before them. But we really don't know what his relationship was like with, between him and God. This is the first instance, this is the first interaction that we see God and Jacob interacting relationally. And what is the result? Deceitful, clever, conniving Jacob worships God and makes a vow. It is a display of humility. Hearts change, right? Hearts change when we encounter God's grace. So it's a a question worth asking, right? How does God's grace change your heart when you think about all that he has accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ? See, I want you to hear this so clearly as we conclude and lead to our final principle that no matter what you've done, no matter your sin, your failings, your past, your background, even your current situation, what you're facing right now, God's grace is a free gift that is meant for you. This is true if you have never come to Christ in faith, and this is true if you are a believer yet struggle to comprehend and trust in God's grace. And this leads us to our final principle And that's God's powerful grace assures us of his presence. God's powerful grace assures us of his presence. You know, so as we conclude, I think we need to reflect again on God's grace through the lens of where we are as in human history. And we are in the age of grace. And what do I mean by that? Why are we in this age of grace? See, that promise that God was carrying out through Abraham through Isaac and through Jacob, what all of this was about was fulfilled in Christ coming to the earth and on that cross and in his resurrection. See, in Christ on the cross, he takes our sins away and absorbs the wrath of God that was rightly to be upon us. In Christ's resurrection, he defeats sin and death once and for all and empowers us to live the life, his life of freedom and grace to a world in desperate need of him. So does the story of God's grace captivate your heart in that way? Uh, Does it take hold of your life when you realize that because of Christ, your sins are totally forgiven, past, present, and future? That because of Christ, God will never leave you, nor forsake you, nor abandon you, even when you sin and even when you fail? Because of Christ, we can be rest assured that every moment of our lives, no matter the outcome, has been sovereignly delivered for his glory and for our good. See, as we see in Isaac and Jacob, hearts change when we encounter God's grace. And they absolutely change when we encounter God's grace in Christ. So I want to ask a question. Do you know Christ as personal Savior? Have you encountered the magnificence of God's grace, which culminates in the person and work of Jesus Christ? Don't wait. Today is the day of salvation. If you think your past or your sins or your addictions or fill in the blank hinder you from coming to him for salvation, then you do not know how gracious and merciful our great God is. Yes, our God is a just God. And he rightly punishes sin. But that judgment has not come for you, right? If you are alive and breathing and listening to this podcast or watching this right now on YouTube, that judgment has not come for you yet. Yes, there is an appointed time. There is an appointed time where God will judge sin. We don't know when that day will be, but that day has not come. Today is the day of salvation. If you're listening to this now, this is God's plea to you to come to him, to bring your sins, to bring your failures, and in repentance and faith, find life in his son. And this is our big idea for today, right? Though sin always has real consequences, both seen and unseen, God's grace always has the last word.
God's grace always has the last word. So come to him now in repentance and faith. Ask your group leader, ask a class staff member from BSF, ask someone who you know is a believer. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to find faith in him? And when you come to him in faith, when you trust in him, you'll find salvation. You will find rest for your weary heart and soul. And you will find grace upon grace upon grace. And lastly, as we conclude, I I wanted to take a note here for the believer, for someone who knows that they are in Christ. Do you trust and rest in his grace today? Or are you continually trying to rely on your goodness, on your works? See, God's grace is a free gift, and that doesn't change even when we come to faith in his son. His grace saves us, but it also empowers us to live in his grace and his freedom every single day of our lives. No matter what our insecurities are, no matter what our burdens No matter what our struggles are, the bad habits that we can't break, or yes, the addictions that we're struggling with as believers, God's grace comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ and reminds us that we have full forgiveness, that we have new life. And when we stop and consider God's grace, no matter what's going on in the world around us, no matter our our circumstances and our lives, We can trust and rest in his grace. He will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He will never let us out of our hands. That is the eternal promise, the eternal goodness that we have in God's grace through Christ Jesus. I hope this encouraged you today. So let's let's pray uh, as we conclude. Father God, I thank you that you are a God of grace, God of magnificent grace, Lord, you're the God of inexhaustible grace. Lord, we can never tire your grace out. In you, we find full forgiveness. Lord, we find rest for your souls, for our souls. And we find freedom and power to live out that grace that you have given us in your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray for those listening or watching this who have not made that decision to follow you, Lord, that they would not delay, that they would trust in you today, that they would find grace and the power to live for you from this point forward. God, I ask you that you would continually remind us of the goodness and the mercy that you bestow on us. Lord, this life is full of pressures and full of disappointments and rejection and loneliness. But you know what, God, when we consider your grace in Christ, we find that life is worth living no matter what happens to us. God, thank you for your promises in Jesus to never leave us and forsake us. Lord, we thank you for maintaining your relationship with us, even when we fail. And God, we ask you that we would rely on your grace more so that we can live out the good works and the free life that you have provided us in Jesus. And it's in his son, in your son's great name that we pray. Amen. Thanks again for listening to the St. Louis Young Adults BSF podcast. Join us next time on Zoom on Monday, February 15th at 7 p.m. Central Time as we discuss Genesis chapter 29. To connect with our class, like us on Facebook at STLYABSF or visit bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. Bible Study Fellowship is an international, interdenominational, nonprofit organization that is dedicated to studying God's Word one verse at a time and strengthening the local church. For more information, visit bsfinternational.org. That's bsfinternational.org.